forward to what God has for us today. First John chapter 3. This morning, if you were in Sunday school, we looked at what love should do. We saw that the love of God is not this ethereal concept, but practically speaking, the love of God helps us purify ourselves. It, it requires separation. The love of God motivates us to action. The love of God gives us boldness, assurance. The love of God helps us love the brothers. And the love of God, practically speaking, moves us toward obedience. But this morning, let's look again at this passage, and let's look and see what love is, the nature of God's love toward us. 1 John 3, we see, as we saw this morning in 1 John 3, chapter 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Right there, we stop and see that this word love, what is the love of God and how it manifests itself, really language fails. You can't really begin to describe it. How do you describe the love of God? Uh, it's big. You know, very quickly, we get into Sunday school, boys and girls Sunday school terminology. God, Jesus. You know, if you stop and think about it, words fail. Words don't do it justice. And you see 1 John here in chapter 3 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That's as much language as he can give it. That, that's all he can do. Because words simply can't define love. And as we said this morning in Sunday school, 1 John was written and he one of the themes he comes back to repeatedly is the love of God. Have you ever looked at 1 John and tried to outline it? It's really difficult. And it was really difficult for me to try to figure out how, what, what's his logic here until I, I realized, and I, that was helped along by several other uh, helps and sources. If you think about it, John is very old at this point. And have you ever listened to a grandfather give stories in his rocker? They're all true, but sometimes they come back. They're circular a little bit. And I'm not, not doubting at all the inspiration. This was perfectly inspired and preserved, and we have it for us today. But it makes sense now that the man was boiled in oil. The man was, uh, he was uh, pushed onto an island. The word's escaping me right now. You, you know the word. He was, uh, yes, that. Thank you. But the man had been through so much. But at the end of his life, he's writing to combat some heresy. He's writing to encourage believers. And he comes back around to some of the same truths. The love of God. We've touched. We've seen him. We know him. Oh, heresy's bad. The love of God. You can know him for sure. And we should be obeying. We ought to be living our lives. And he comes back around and keeps coming back. And one of the themes he comes back to often in this little epistle is the love of God. Out of the 13 times in the New Testament that we see the phrase love of God, five of those are right here in the little book of 1 John. So what is love? Well, this morning with God's help after we pray, we're going to see that the love of God is incredible. The love of God is sacrificial. And the love of God is unconditional. Father, would you help us in this concept of love? Perhaps this morning we're coming at it and maybe we think that we know it. None of us do. None of us can. Help us to see once again the beauty, the wonderful, the incredible nature of love. And as we start our revival this morning, would the love of God permeate our hearts and our minds? And would everything else be pushed aside? There are questions, there are distractions, there are issues that we must face, and that's true for everybody here. But for the next few minutes, would you help us to concentrate on what love is, on the nature of biblical love? Would you help me as I preach to preach biblically accurate, theologically accurately, but to preach passionately your truth as you've showed and demonstrated to me in my life? Help us to see what love is. And would all of us take steps of faith and would love not be this nebulous concept or some foggy emotion that carries a faulty idea in our minds? Would the love of God be a real transforming truth in each of our lives? Oh, Lord, I can't do that. I can't change hearts, but you can. I pray you take your word this morning and change us with it. In Jesus' name, amen. We see, first of all, in 1 John 3, that the love of God is incredible. We already mentioned it, but words just fail. You know, each of us has limits to our love. Isn't that right? We love based on what has been given to us. We love family. We love our church family. 
we may even extend that love a little bit beyond the people, perhaps a close neighbor that we've known for a while. But in all honesty, our love is limited, is it not? But God's love isn't. It's incredible, first of all, in its quantity. We're limited in our connections. We're limited in everything. But God loves the world. It's not a problem. How many of you guys are on social media? Anybody on social media? Facebook, Twitter, TwitFace, YouTube, whatever it is now. Um, yeah. How many friends do you have? Say a number. Three? Just kidding. Hopefully a few more than that. 300? 800? Why don't you have a million? Why not two million? Well, I, I, you know, and even, even those of you who may have eight, nine hundred thousand friends that follow you on Facebook, do you really know those people well? No, I was in school with them back 20 years ago in high school, and I fronted them just so you can see what their kids look like, right? Right? Yeah. Why is that? Because we're limited in our sphere. We're very limited. And even these people that are very popular, you know, there's uh, people that are big in our culture that have eight, nine million followers on social media. Do they really know all those people? No, they can't. I can't even remember some of my kids' names sometimes, let alone my friends' names. Who's that? Who, yeah, we, we met them a while ago. What's their name? Let's look it up. Oh, yeah, it's this person. It's so-and-so, right? That's the nice thing about social media sometimes. You remember names. Or, oh, yeah, I got to remember that name. But in all reality, we're very limited in who we can love because that's, that's our sphere. We're limited in who we know because we're limited in knowledge. We're, we're not omnipotent. We're not omniscient. We're oftentimes not even where we're at. Our minds are somewhere else, but not our God. And behold, what manner of love that the Father hath bestowed upon us. We think about how incredible the nature of the love of God is, first of all, because of its quantity. God loved the world. Does anybody know how many people right now are in the world? To the, to the decimal. No, just kidding. 7.6 billion. That's a lot of people. That's more friends than I have on Facebook. But God loves individually, by name, by personality, because he created them. Every single one of those people. That's astounding. I've been to the Philippines seven times. I'm always, 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 always flabbergasted the amount of people. Reports of over 27 million people in the greater Manila area. It's a few more people than Escambia County has. 27 million people, and yet God knows each one of those people's names. That's beyond me. That's incredible. God loves the world in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is incredible. God loves the world, and it just doesn't stop with a select few. God loves the world, everybody. And we can't understand that. We can't begin to even, that boggles our mind to begin with. That God would take the time to love every single soul and have a plan for them and the desire that every single person be made right with him and spend eternity in him with heaven. That's love. The love of God is incredible. Beyond what I, can, what I can even show to my family, beyond what I can show to my church family, beyond what I can show to brothers and sisters in Christ that I meet all around the world. That's, that's, that, that's love. That's big love. That's crazy. I can't even begin to imagine that. But God loves the world. But it doesn't stop, stop there. Look what it says again in verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, I can love you, biblically speaking, and love, by the way, is desiring the best for somebody else. It's sacrificing for that person. It's not trying to get something from somebody. No, love is a sacrifice. We'll see that. But I can biblically love you, not in any sick, weird, worldly sense, but I can't make you my child. Some of you are like, amen, I don't want to be. I can genuinely love a person. I can show genuine concern for perhaps one of the bus kids that's here even today that's facing some difficulties. And there's been chances and times where I've seen good godly people in churches like this who have even adopted bus ministry children that were facing issues, facing problems. We can show love. But what we cannot do is go inside that person's heart and soul and radically change their nature. But that's exactly what God does. That's huge. 
The love of God is not only incredible in its quantity, but it's incredible in its quality. That we should be called the sons of God. I can love people, but I can't make them my child. John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 2 Peter 1, 4 says, By these promises we might be partakers of the divine nature. That's amazing. Through the promises that we have in Jesus Christ, you and I, if we're a saved child of God, are partakers of the divine nature. That's love. That God would open himself up enough for hurt that God would open himself, his divinity up enough that you and I could be partakers of his nature, divine nature. Wow. That we should be called the sons of God. It says in Ephesians 3, that we may be able to comprehend the breadth and the depth and the length and the height and to understand the love of Christ which passes knowledge. If you stop and think about it, love of God, yeah, that's a concept we've probably sung about, talked about, asked about. Uh, written about even since the time in Sunday school. But stop and think about it for a second. That's incredible. That's, that, that, that's astounding. That, that's mind-blowing in all the truest sense. Ephesians 1, 4, and I don't fully understand the theological implications, but according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You know, let's just make this pulpit right here, the timeline of history. You know, you have the garden here, and you keep going. You have Jesus Christ 4,000 years later, and you have us 2,000 years after that. Here we are, 6,000 years of history. Well, God's not bound by time. He's not. He, he, he's, he's there, 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 there. He's everywhere right, right now. We're bound by time. We're finite. He's infinite. And that what's ma- that's what makes him God, one of the many aspects. But let's go back 10,000 years. There's 6,000 years. We're right here. Here we are, 10,000 years before creation. You know what you have? You have a God who knows you and loves you. Who knows your faults. Who knows your failures. Knows the choices you would make that would hurt him. And yet he loves you. That's incredible. I know me. And sometimes I struggle loving me. And you know you. Right? That God loves. That's incredible. That's amazing love. Behold what manner of love. You can't even describe it. You can't, you just got to say it's incredible. And that's not even doing it justice. It's incredible in its quantity. God loves the world. It's incredible in its quality that you and I should become the sons of God, that he would make us partakers of the divine nature. That's love. God didn't need us. It's not like the Trinity was up in heaven waiting for creation. Oh, well, are we ready to create yet? Because we're really lonely up here. Are we ready to get this, this mankind thing going? Because we're, wow, man, we, it's been a long time since we've had it. No. From eternity past to eternity future, they're, they're secure. They're fine. They're, they're, they're secure in themselves. They don't need us. And yet God still chose to create a creation that he knew would go against him. He still chose from eternity past to choose to love them. Boggles your mind theologically. and There's all other questions we could ask. and We have to stick close to scripture to make sure we don't get off into wrong doctrine. That's amazing. That's incredible. The love of God is incredible. This theme that we sing about, this theme that we talk about, that we've learned about from the time we're kids. Love, 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 love. But stop and think about what it means actually theologically. And our minds have to go, whoa, this is bigger than me. This is incredible. Not only is the love of God incredible, secondly, we see that the love of God is sacrificial. Look at verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How do we know that God loves us? He proved it. Look over with me at chapter 4, verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ died for us. Verse 9, in this was manifested that the love of God toward us because that the God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And then look over at verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. This is the nature of love. Love is not about what you and I get. And for the young people, the unmarried in here, love is not about what you and I, uh, what you and I can get from a relationship. No, no, no. That's not love. That's lust. 
Love is always about what is given, the sacrifice that is made, and God proved his love in that he sent his only begotten son, the Father, the self-sustaining, covenant-keeping God who needs nothing but to be complete, but has everything already, willingly sent the Son, part of himself to be the Savior of the world, separated the Trinity for you and I. That's incredible. That's sacrificial. That's real love. Christ died for us. You think about sacrifices in history. I enjoy reading war stories. Do you? I just finished an audio book. You know, always there's, there's some things you have to be careful about because it's war stories. But some incredible sacrifices that our countrymen, our nation has gone through. I just finished the audio book on Broken. Story of a Christian who later became a Christian, Louis Samparini. Wow, what a sacrifice. I think about the men at Dunkirk, especially the English Navy, the Coast Guard, who rescued some almost half a million men from utter annihilation, guaranteed annihilation, and who did it at great peril. That's sacrifice. But even on a family level, you think about the sacrifice of a father who works long hours trying to put bread and trying, trying to put shoes on young people. We say thank you to fathers. Thank for my dad. Think about the sacrifice, incredible sacrifice of a mother who sacrifices sleep, time, energy, privacy, their body to bring kids into the world. That's a sacrifice. But those don't even touch the sacrifice of our God. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That's love. That's sacrifice. But not only that, the, sacri- the love of God is not only incredible, it's sacrificial, but thirdly, it's unconditional. Look with me what it says here in verse 10. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And look at verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. What were you thinking when Christ died back 2,000 years ago? What were you thinking when Christ died on the cross? Oh, wait a minute. You, you weren't thinking, were you? you? You weren't there yet. You weren't even a thought of a thought of a thought of a thought. You, you and I weren't even in the, the picture. unconditionally. Romans 5, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. You know, some of us have seen the secret service. I've been to Washington, D.C. and seen the men looking around for the dignitaries. I've only seen the president in a motorcade passing. Perhaps you've gotten the privilege to see an actual uh, president of the United States sitting, or even a past president. But the Secret Service are there to protect the president. And all around the world, there are men and even women who have given themselves, who have hazarded their life to protect a good office, a good man, a king, a ruler, authority, etc. But God sent his son in Romans 5, 8 to die for sinners. He didn't send his son because he knew there was something redeemable here. He didn't send his son because he knew there was, oh, I wanted, I, there, there's something special about that person. No, he sent his son to die for sinners. That's unconditional love. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 1, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. 
Romans 8, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, the love of God is unconditional. God loves you. Nothing can change that. Nothing can change that. And to every person who's ever been alive, God has demonstrated his love to you. God has demonstrated his love and the fact that God has sent his son Jesus to die for your sin. That's love. This again is a concept that oftentimes if we're not careful, we can easily overlook. We can easily pass by. We can easily say, oh, I, I know that. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brent, I, I know the, the love of God. Well, 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 friend, do you? Have you tasted that love? I don't want to take for granted here today that there may be somebody here who's never placed their faith and trust in Christ. You may be a good person. You may be a religious person. You may be a moral person. But friend, you can spend your life going to church. It doesn't make you a Christian. You can spend your life in a garage. It doesn't make you a car. What you and I must have is a new birth. And that's all possible because of the love of God. God loves you. Well, Brent, you don't know my background. I don't. But God does, and he still loves you. You don't know what I've done to God. You don't know what I've said. You don't know my past. I, I don't. But while you're breathing here, God is demonstrating his love for you. God loves you. And I don't understand all the ramifications of that spiritually and even theologically, but wow, what a concept. That God loves you and I, that, that's beyond us. That he loves us incredibly. He, he loves the world, but not only does he just love the world. Yeah, I, I love the world, I'll, I'll friend each. No, no, no. He makes it so each person in the world can be his son. Partakers of the divine nature. He loves us sacrificially. He sent his own son to die for you and I. My son's sitting here right now. If there was something that happened and I had to choose between your life and my son, Sorry. Not sacrificing my son ain't happening. I'd sacrifice my life, but not my son's. But God chose his son's life for you and I. That's sacrifice. And God died for you, sent his son to die for you, even before you were a concept. Even though he knew all about you, even though he knew, well, Brent, you just don't understand what I've done. God knew before the foundation of the world what you would do. To say any less is to say that God doesn't know. God knew exactly who you were, exactly what you do. And yet God still loved you and I. That's incredible. That's love. Several months ago, I was challenged by a ministry friend to write a love letter. Now, uh, let, me, let me just stop right there. I, I'm not, I don't consider myself a very emotionally hung guy. Most guys probably here aren't either. I don't watch opera. I watch football. I, I don't really get in touch with my inner self type deal. I, I, I'm a guy. I don't do that. So, when, you know, when I first got this challenge to write a love letter, like, okay, okay, what am I going to say? Uh, blah, blah, I love you, God. I was missing the whole thing. The challenge was actually for you to write a love letter in the place of Jesus, what Jesus would say to you. Well, that got me thinking. And got me wondering. And I was studying this passage at the same time. And, and this is what I came up with. We'll close with this. This is God's love letter to me. You put your name in the blank. Dear Brent. I love you. I always have. I always will. You are completely secure in my hands. As well as being in my father's hands. You have the spirit dwelling in you. Sealing you unto that blessed day. When your faith will be sight. It is my good pleasure to keep you safe and secure while I am living my perfect life through you. And one day, I will present you faultless before the throne of heaven. Every moment, I am thinking and praying for you and longing for you to experience the relationship with me that will bring you complete satisfaction and meet your deepest desires and needs. I want you to be filled with the knowledge of my will, being absolutely certain not only of your eternal home with me, but also of my purpose and working in you. I sacrifice for you on Calvary, so rest assured that I want to freely give you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Brent, I want you to know that there's absolutely nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate you from my love. My love for you is deeper than you can know. 
but I want to just begin to understand of it, you to understand it this side of eternity. And then I want to show you for all of forever how much I truly love you. For now, just come and spend time with me every day. Open my book and find truth to change and guide you. Find promises to uphold you. But make sure every day you find me. As you find me, you will see that your frantic, stress-filled life will become rest. And that all the enticements of the temporal will begin to lose their appeal. I want you to find the depth of my love for you, for you. I love you, Brent. I always have. I always will. Your best friend, Jesus. Love is one of those concepts that if we're not careful, we can relegate to a, oh yeah, I understand the love of God. Yeah, I learned that in Sunday school. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that. Oh, do you? At the end of his life, the beloved apostle couldn't even express it, but kept coming back to the fact that God is love. The love of God, how incredible it is. It's incredible. It's sacrificial. It's unconditional. Have you experienced